The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, Trump's press secretary. Perhaps you should look into it and give me some answers. And she's fighting back against fake news. I guess I would turn the question back on the media and ask similar questions. David Brody's exclusive interview with Kayla McEnany. I was in panic mode right before. Plus, Pastor Tony Evans. God just doesn't move you to a bend. How we can be stronger together while still being apart on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Ladies and gentlemen, it was murder, pure and simple. I don't want to hear that some police officer who murders somebody gets off with uh, having suspension and a loss of pay and allowances for a couple of months. This guy ought to be tried for murder, and the one who stood by should be tried as an accessory to murder. It isn't a question of mercy. It isn't a question of love and forgiveness. It's a question of trying a murderer for a killing. And this cop killed a man in Minneapolis. There was no question about it. The man was not resisting. He was in handcuffs. The officer had his knee on his neck. The man was crying out he couldn't breathe, and he died. He died at the hands of a reckless police officer who himself had been disciplined. This isn't some civil rights thing. We shouldn't have all this rioting and all that business. They ought to just try him. It's just that simple. He ought to be tried for murder. And the guy who stood by should be tried as an accessory to murder. And then I am pro-police, ladies and gentlemen. I really believe law and order is important. The police officers do a great service for the nation. And I am pleased to report that we have here competent police officers on our staff who are trained and they are well qualified. But I think to have somebody who has disciplined himself for misconduct to leave him on the police force, and then to see that thing. This man had not been convicted of a crime. His only offense was potentially passing a bad check, and that had not been proved in court. And he was not resisting arrest. He was not fighting or doing anything else. And in this case, it's just simple. Try that police officer for murder, and the man who was standing by his ex access as accessory to murder. And once that happens, then you'll send a message, you guys have got to play by the book. And if indeed they are attacked by somebody, then they need to use force. They are given weapons, they are given clubs, they are given training. But this is something that we need to deal with. Uh, it, it, that's my solution. And yes, we uh, be merciful, but uh, we don't need a whole bunch of protests. I mean, you know, the, but the, the black community needs to know that the law, the law is on their side. But this thing says, no, the law is not on your side. The law is against you. And the law should be for them. We have law, the same law for black people, white people, Asians, Latin Americans, all the rest of it. We shouldn't be one kind of law in America. And now apparently the president is going to take to see the justice is done. We hope Jenna Browder has the story. Protests turned violent in Minneapolis overnight with one man killed as people across the country continue to demand justice for George Lloyd. Just like they killed that white woman over north. Demonstrators clashing with police, businesses looted, and this auto zone set on fire. But many demonstrators marching peacefully. And are literally marching through traffic. And in LA, protesters stopped freeway traffic. They also gathered in Houston, where Floyd grew up. Cameras captured the final moments of Floyd's life. Floyd unarmed and handcuffed with a white police officer kneeling on his neck. As he says, I can't breathe. After about five minutes, he stops breathing and appears unconscious. The officer's knee is still on his neck. Police were on the scene responding to a call about a forged check used at a store. All four officers have been fired, and now the mayor of Minneapolis is calling for that one officer to be arrested and charged. What we witnessed on that video was hard. The notion that you or I would have been put in jail upon doing something like that, and he was not, it's just wrong. Derek Chauvin, the officer who was kneeling on Floyd's neck, had reportedly received multiple complaints about police conduct during his 19-year career, but no disciplinary action was taken against him. 
President Trump was asked about Floyd's death yesterday in Florida. Well, we're going to look at it and we're going to get a report tomorrow when we get back. And we're going to get a very full report, but a very sad day. The president later tweeting he had ordered investigations into Floyd's death by the FBI and Justice Department. And faith leaders are speaking out too. On Twitter, Franklin Graham, this makes me sick to my stomach. What took place yesterday on a Minneapolis street by the Minneapolis PD should deeply concern each and every American. And award-winning Christian artist Lecrae with this video on Instagram. What we're experiencing out here right now in this world is pure unadulterated evil. And saying people should be angry, but adding. Use that anger to be constructive. Use it for prayer, for policy changes, for programs that we can get involved in to change the way that things are right now. Be characterized by your love and productivity. And don't let hatred and bitterness where you are, because then evil wins. Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. I'm, I'm sure this thing is going to uh, come up. But, I mean, you don't deal with this by protests, by burning down stores and having riots. That's not the answer. But the answer is to take it quickly. And the mayor of Minneapolis needs to move quickly. He needs to convene a grand jury and get on with it immediately and let the black community know that the, the law and order is on their side. And then those policemen need to be trained. And if there are any bad apples in the group, they need to be fired. You know, that's the ones you fire, not wait till they kill somebody and then say, well, we're going to take them off the force. Take them off quickly. And there needs to be personnel reduction all the way across the board in these police departments because they have an awesome responsibility and they are that thin blue line that keeps us from uh, violence. And we want police. We want to help the police. We want to do everything we can to support the police. I am a great supporter of the police. And I, I think that all of us should be. But at the same time, we cannot allow anything like this to happen. It was so blatant. And the fact that there was a video that that cop didn't realize that there was somebody taking pictures of him doing what he was doing, horrible. We cannot have this in America. We cannot have it anymore. You know, I, 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 I personally, I personally was kneeling in prayer with a group of young black teenagers in the city of Portsmouth, Virginia, and I was charged by a police dog. I know what it feels like to be on the other end of that. And I don't blame these kids. I mean, it was peaceful. We were praying. We had reached out to these young people, and they were, they were on their knees coming to Jesus. And I got, we got charged by a police dog with his mouth you know, open and his fangs. Um, and the police cruiser pulled up beside us and, and charged us with dogs. That's the way it used to be down here, and I don't like that. We're not going to have that in any other part of the country. And today, by the way, is the anniversary of a terrible shooting that took place in Virginia Beach. We'll tell you about it later. Uh, when a disgruntled uh, f uh, worker in the, in the, you know, it, the bureaucracy uh, got loose and killed a number, how many people, it was 11 people? So it was, it was a, I don't remember the exact number, but it well, was a tragic It, it was day. a horrible slaughter. We'll talk about that more. Well, in other news, the coronavirus is still taking a terrible toll on our economy. George Thomas brings us the latest numbers from our CBN newsroom. Thank you, Pat. You're exactly right. Jobless claims were up again in today's latest government report as another 2.1 million people filed for unemployment benefits. That makes some 41 million applications since the lockdown began. Today's numbers, as you know, come as the U.S. death toll from COVID-19 has now passed 100,000. Turning overseas, folks, now from India and Pakistan to Africa and the Middle East, farmers are facing a perfect storm, already struggling with crippling coronavirus lockdowns. They now face billions of locusts devouring crops and putting millions at risk. Here's a look at the havoc they are causing. This was the scene in parts of northern and central India this week as billions of desert locusts descended. It's India's worst infestation in a quarter century, causing unprecedented devastation as the migratory pests devoured hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland. The problem with the locust group is that they eat up the leaves of crops standing in the agriculture fields. It also hurts animals subsequently. 
Indian farmers banged pots and pans to ward off the dangerous insects to no avail. The government in New Delhi dispatched teams to spray insecticide, but the damage was already done. The insects swarmed Pakistan earlier in the week before heading east. The Food and Agriculture Organization says a relatively small swarm covering close to half a square mile can include up to 80 million locusts and travel 150 miles in a single day. A group monitoring the insects in India reported at least 10 such swarms chewing through crops as of Wednesday. And it's only going to get worse. Heavy rains and the cyclone season in June are expected to see the swarms multiply. As we have reported, the food supplies and livelihoods of millions across Africa and Middle East also remain under threat. This UN map shows the locust infestation spreading from the Horn of Africa across the Arabian Gulf to Yemen, Saudi Arabia and to parts of Iran and Afghanistan. Somalia among the hardest hit countries. Recent flooding, locusts and the pandemic posing a triple threat there. The government in Mogadishu declaring a national emergency. The consequences for Somalia are acute. Even before COVID, more than 5 million Somalis required humanitarian assistance. The desert locust forecast between now and late July shows the infestation continuing to pose a serious threat to large areas of Africa, Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. Pat, uh, the UN is saying unusual weather in the Arabian desert is allowing these pesky uh, critters to mushroom. Thank you, George. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've got to look at the fact from the biblical point of view a plague of locusts was considered a judgment of God. And it just looks like when you, these things are, are cascading, it's like God himself is bringing judgment upon the nation. And the trouble is that the people who are hardest hit are the most vulnerable, the poor. And all across Africa, there's going to be a tremendous famine. This is now is bringing it into India, tremendous famine. These people will not have enough food to eat. They'll be starving. And the locusts are bringing famine, and the coronavirus is bringing plague. And before long, there will be a war because uh, the nations will begin to rise up against one another. India and China are already at each other's throats. And it looks like a confrontation may be taking place uh, up in the uh, mountain areas. And um, the world is, is being convulsed. And I do think that we ought to ask ourselves to the Lord, God, what are you telling us? What are you saying with this terrible famine, the terrible plague, and the terrible uh, financial crisis that is confronting the, the world? And if a war comes on top of it, uh, I'm, you read in Ezekiel and you read in other, the prophets about what happens when God sends these plagues on the earth. And did it come from him? Uh, is he sending this plague of locusts, or is it just something that's happening? Well, uh, I, I would like to think that maybe the Lord is in charge of this world, and um, we need to cry out to him and say, God Almighty, spare this world in which we live. George. Pat, here at home this Sunday, Virginia Beach, Virginia, will mark one year since a city employee fatally shot 12 people and wounded four others. For many survivors, first responders, and even the mayor, it has been a painful year. My colleague Heather Sells brings us that story. Tia Howell was leaving Building 1 on that Friday afternoon, May 31st, when another Virginia Beach City employee called her to come back. She actually saved my life because as I was getting ready to walk out, it was reported that the shooter was actually in the same parking lot that I parked in, and he actually shot someone right where my car was parked. Howell, a city financial administrator and young mom, immediately ran to the first floor mailroom. I remember just sitting under that desk, just praying and crying. And I even try to reach out to my parents to tell them that, you know, I love them. I didn't know what was going to happen because we didn't get any information. It was just dark, black, and they just kept telling us to be quiet. Mayor Bobby Dyer was headed home after work when his assistant called with the news. She said there's an active shooter on campus on our campus. 
And then I started getting phone calls. You know, there was a fatality. There were more fatalities. The gunman killed 12 people before police shot him. He died later at a local hospital, leaving a host of unanswered questions as multiple investigations have found no motive. One year later, victims and survivors still carry visible and invisible wounds, and that includes the mayor. After the dust settled and, you know, um, you know, after a while, I had, I had to get some counseling myself. You know, it's, uh, you know, you got to be, you know, as a leader, you got to be strong at times, but you also have to be human at times. In the beginning, I thought that I could handle it. However, I found myself sitting at my desk, crying most of the time. Oftentimes, my coworkers would come into my office crying. We would go into each other's offices crying. Um, and that lasted at least about a good three to four months of continuous, continually crying and just lamenting over the co-workers that we lost. Howell also sought counseling, received a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress, and had to leave her job. And she's not alone, so the city has provided free counseling for anyone affected. This month, Virginia Beach painted a giant forget-me-not symbol at a local park. But it had to cancel its memorial events planned for this weekend in light of COVID restrictions. Instead, it's offering an online remembrance, and the mayor wants victims and survivors to know they are not forgotten. We will embrace these people in perpetuity. We will eventually come together. But, you know, this is, was the worst day in the history of Virginia Beach, and we intend to continue to show honor and respect for those affected. Howell says she still experiences fear when she walks into public buildings, but she's thankful to God for the healing he has already provided. The word is true. If you pray and seek his face, he really, really, really will help you and calm your fears. Heather Sells, CBN News. Thank you, Heather. By the way, Pat, uh, Virginia Beach uh, city officials are urging folks to wear blue tomorrow in remembrance of uh, the victims and those who lost their lives. Thank you, George. It was a tragic day for the city. You think, well, that is, happens in L.A., it happens in Chicago. Here in Virginia Beach, you wouldn't think it would happen, but it does. Uh, the, the, there's violence everywhere in this world, and, uh, well, we, we, we mourn those who passed on and who were needlessly killed, but there have been so many. There was a shooting out there in Las Vegas that was so tragic, and you go through the list of what people can do, but again, uh, it's not uh, guns that shoot people, it's people who shoot people. And uh, uh, it's a tragedy that this thing's happening. Yeah. But um, I guess violence is a part of the natural life. Men have been killing each other since Cain slew Abel, so it's not anything new. But in our society today, it seems so out of the yeah, norm I, I, and should. <laughs> well, out of the norm, but uh, I don't know. We've had so many of these things, but so often, from what I've found, um, Many of these people who do these extreme acts are themselves taking some kind of antidepressant. And I think that the link between uh, the uh, antidepressants and violence has been, should be explored, it should be determined, and we should moderate the use of these things because many of these people at Virginia Tech, there was a killing. And other places where there have been uh, people who've, who've been deranged, who get a gun and begin to shoot people. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking to see it happen. But anyhow, in Virginia Beach, we mourn the passing of these people. W was the number, again, I, I, it, you said 11, 11 12, I think it was 12. 12. Yeah, and it, it, this Sunday will be the actual anniversary. And, and Bobby event. Dyer is a graduate of Regent University, and he has a uh, doctorate in uh, organization leadership. And we're very proud of him as yes. the mayor of the a city. Great job. Yeah, he's a good guy. Okay, well. Well, up next, the feisty press secretary, White House spokeswoman Kaylee McEnany is standing up for the president. What goes through her mind right before she steps up to the podium? Plus, he's been named one of the most effective preachers in the world. How is he leading his church through the COVID crisis? Dr. Tony Evans joins us live, and that's later on today's 700 Club.
Well, she's a fierce defender of President Trump. And you already know that if you've seen White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany in action. But did you know that this feisty Harvard Law grad is also fiercely devoted to Jesus Christ? CBN's David Brody brings us this exclusive look at an unstoppable woman of faith in a role that is larger than life. Hello, everyone. It is a significant job with a prestigious title, but to better understand Kayleigh McEnany's path to the White House, you need to understand her overall view of life. And I believe um, God put me in this place for a purpose and for a reason, like he does with each and every life. Um, we are all here for a reason. As White House press secretary, her daily purpose is to present, explain, and defend the president's decisions and policies. And her preparation shows as she often turns the tables on a hostile media. I assume you care about fairness and accuracy in our elections, do you not? I guess I would turn the question back on the media and ask similar questions. Perhaps you should look into it and get me some answers. At just 32 years of age, McEnany is one of the youngest ever to hold this position. While the Harvard Law grad looks calm, cool, and collected behind the legendary podium, it was a different story before her very first briefing. I was in panic mode right before. So that led to an impromptu West Wing prayer session. I was just rattled and extremely nervous and mm. feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, and I called my mom and on speakerphone, my family and I, we all prayed together. All of a sudden, I took a deep breath, and after those prayers, it move forward. I felt such strength, went in, talked to the president, and then walked out and did the job that only could be done if God was there helping you along the way. She also got some help that day from former press secretary Sarah Sanders. Sarah is a wise mentor, and in fact, that day when I was so nervous before the first pre press briefing, it was her um, text that helped me uh, quite, quite a lot in that moment because that she right? sent me a Jesus Calling devotional. Raised in a Southern Baptist home and attending a Florida Catholic all-girls school, the call of Jesus has always been near. As a teenager, Kaylee walked down the aisle of her church to give her life to Christ. And then in her 20s, something happened that deepened her faith even more. I was going through a hard time in New York and I was going to a great church in New York and I um, remember feeling very lonely. It was when I first started my young professional life. Um, and I remember getting a call and I never answered numbers I didn't know, but I answered that day and it said, um, hey, this is the Journey Church. We feel like we need to pray for you right now. How can we pray for you? And it was at a distinct moment that I needed to hear from Christ and I felt that he communicated to me through my church. And it's that moment I think my faith became even more real. That faith has helped Kaylee deal with adversity, especially when she found out that her mom and other women in her extended family carried a rare gene that makes breast cancer very likely. She got tested in college and then got a phone call. It was close to Christmas Eve. It was right around that time and just crying because I got a call from the doctor saying you have this this genetic mutation. I didn't know what to do with it. For the next decade, Kaylee considered prevention in the form of a double mastectomy, but wanted to wait until she could go through it with a future soulmate. Well, enter Sean. You look beautiful. Thank you. Year after their marriage vows, she took the preemptive plunge. I had um, a nipple sparing mastectomy um, and they removed my breast tissue. And I'm able to say today that I will never get breast cancer. Or my chances are like 0.001% because of that choice. To mark the occasion, she wore socks with bright lemons on them, reinforcing the message that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And boy, oh boy, has she been making lemonade. She joined CNN as a conservative voice and outnumbered, but standing her ground. He was the let first him, person. He was the first person to allow hit the campaign trail, becoming a top Republican Party official. President Trump has achieved for this country. He's the greatest president in our lifetime. But the sweetest moment came with the birth of her baby girl. As a newborn, Blake joined mom on the campaign trail at times, and now she's made it to the White House. Husband Sean playing the role of stay-at-home dad in Florida, and her family pitches in too. Meanwhile, Kaylee travels back and forth from home to her high-stress day job. Do you need an Excedrin at times? <laughs> it, it is a balance. It's a tough sacrifice on all sides. But I know at the end of the day, if I give Blake the same 
faith upbringing and relationship with Jesus Christ that my parents gave me. She will be an unstoppable woman of faith in whatever she decides to do. Blake will have a pretty good role model on that front. For example, Kaylee found time to lead weekly Bible studies while with the Trump campaign. We would pray and read the word and it just gave um, a little pep in our step because these days are demanding, they're challenging, they're long um, in politics, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that's the nature of the job. And that just, I think it, it was a little rod of lightning of just energy and joy in our day. Nowadays, it's not always so joyful when she looks out into the briefing room. You wonder if a, a strong conservative Christian supporting Donald Trump drives the media uh, up a wall. I think that's right. Um, people are attacked for their faith, not just me, but Christian men and women across this country. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate, but I think we found a real voice in President Trump who stood for religious freedom and pro-life and given us this boldness. And it was at Harvard Law School when I felt attacked as a conservative and as a Christian that I realized it was that megaphone and that kind of boldness we needed and that kind of fighter we needed uh, to represent um, the Christian community. And so McEnany is here now for this role of a lifetime. And while she works for the commander in chief, she ultimately plays to an almighty audience of one. My mission in life is that when I pass, that I, he will look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And if I can end my life that way, it doesn't matter what the people say on the way there. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. Well, you can see David Brody's exclusive interview with Kaylee McEnany anytime online by subscribing to the free CBN News channel on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash CBN News online. Amazing young lady, Harvard Law, brilliant person. It's like she's been prepared for the position. Wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes. Double mastectomy and all the rest of it. She's a, she's a fighter, a Christian woman uh, in a position of, of well, important. Key influence, really. Amen. All right. Well, still ahead, stronger together in the age of social distancing. Dr. Tony Evans shares how the church can unite in the middle of a pandemic. But first, a drug dealing superman, this jet setting team thought he was invincible. What happens when a rival rats him out? Find out that's next. Well, Tony Askew thought he had all the trimmings of a perfect life. Tony had the cash. He had the cars. He had the clothes. And Tony had the women. But he had no idea what was waiting for him right around the corner. As a kid, if your father telling you, you're going to come spend time with you, that's like the most exciting thing to you. So I remember just waiting outside, and my mother telling me, come on in to eat, son. I said, no, nah, mama, dad said he gonna, come in, he gonna come and pick me up. He never came. He lied to me. So like, you know, as, as a kid, that kind of kind of hurt. For Tony Askew, the pain of that rejection grew into anger. I couldn't deal with nobody saying nothing to me. I would get conduct notices almost every day for fighting in school. Even at the lunchroom table, kids say something to me, I jumped over the table to fight. And that, that's how I dealt with my, you know, my emotion. Tony's hardworking mom tried to steer him the right way by making sure he was in church, but he couldn't grasp the idea of a loving God. I didn't know nothing about God. I just thought that the people in church was faking and running around with their hands up. I didn't know that he, he loved me and cared for me no matter what, you know, wanted me to come closer to him, wanted me to be a part of his life. Despite his mom's efforts, Tony would enter a life of crime. At 10, he was stealing candy to sell at school. Later, he stole from stores and homes. I had no conscience as far as stealing. I, I did it like, it like it was just a natural thing to do. I always thought I would be able to outsmart, you know, the authorities. Then, after graduating from high school, Tony started selling drugs. Soon, he was living the party lifestyle of a successful drug dealer. It made me feel powerful. Um, uh, went to Cancun, you know, at 19 with your own. We had our own apartment at 19, own cars, 
um, partying girls. Um, I just, I felt powerful. Dealing drugs was a dangerous world, but over the next decade, Tony would make millions. He enjoyed a lavish life filled with nice homes, cars, and world travel. He gave little thought to anyone but himself. I felt important. Uh, I felt um, like Superman. I felt on top of the world. I felt that, you know, anything I could do, I can do. Nobody can tell me I can't do nothing. I was cocky and arrogant. And I remember this female asked me, how did I feel? And I said, perfect. I said, perfect. I really felt that way, you know, at that time. But as more years passed, Tony grew paranoid about getting caught and decided he wanted out. About the same time, his girlfriend, Natasia, became pregnant. Tony wanted to be there for his child since his own dad wasn't there for him. He was really um, into family, and I picked up on that a lot. And he often even talked about, you know, like what it would be like whenever he had a child. I really, really loved that about him. The problem was, he felt trapped by the high cost of his lifestyle. I didn't want to be selling drugs, to be honest with you. Like, I sold drugs just for the money. I knew it wasn't right, but I had to do I had to keep doing it. Tony didn't have to wait long for an out. Another dealer squealed on him to federal agents, and Tony was arrested in 2005 for drug trafficking. Now desperate, he wondered if God could help him. God had to be tugging at my heart. In my spirit, something was happening in me like, Grab that Bible, open that Bible up. That's the only person that's gonna help you right now. You can't get yourself out of this. You need a greater power to get you out of this. Tony asked to go to the Christian block of the jail, where he read God's word and came to a life-changing decision. The presence of God was on me so strong, it, it, it changed me. I had that peace that surpassed all understanding came over me, and, and I looked at life differently. I said, Lord, you real. I gave my life to Christ. I know that Jesus died for my sin. I wouldn't think that God would, would forgive a person like me, you know, but he did. He loved me that much. That's when I start thinking about the people that I, you know, that I hurt, you know, um, even from the people who bought drugs from me. A whole new gate had opened up for me of caring about people and caring about people's feelings. And I have a conscience now. Tony was convicted and would spend the next nine years in prison. During that time, he grew in his faith and started to heal from the hurt of his dad's rejection all those years earlier. I forgave him for not being there for me when I was a little kid. God repaired that hurt from my youth. You know, he transformed my mind, renewed my mind. Through all those years, Natasia and their son Princeton waited for Tony. After working through many issues, the couple married in 2018. When he came home, there was no partying or anything like that. He's always home, wanting to be involved with the family. He definitely became more humble. He was able to talk about, you know, not just how things benefit him, but how they benefit other people. Tony started his own trucking company and works hard to provide for his family. His main goal is clearer than ever. I want to make God proud. I, when I go before him, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Also, showing love. That's a real man, showing love, um, showing compassion, showing empathy for others, something that I never had before. Letting people know that it's Christ that changed me, and, 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 and that's why I'm who I am today. It's a nice word. It's Christ that's changed me. That's who I am. That's He's made me the person I am today. You know, money won't do it. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, what can you give in exchange for your soul? You have one life. It won't last but so long, and then it's over. And no amount of money, of drugs, of pleasure, of sex, of whatever it is you find your, your pleasure in, it won't satisfy. Because as the great theologian said, our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. Your heart is restless till it rests in thee. And Tony had what looked like everything, and then he had nothing. And then all that 
material stuff was taken away from him. But he found Jesus. And when he found him, he found the answers to life. So if you want to know real peace, if you want to know real joy, if you want to know real happiness, why don't you turn to the Lord? The wicked are like the troubled sea, the Bible says. They are not happy. But great peace of they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. If you want to know peace and you want to know happiness, I ask you to pray with me right now. Pray these words. Meet them in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner. And Lord, I know you died for me. And I know that you rose from the dead and you live forevermore. And so, Lord, I come to you as a sinner. I come to you as one who has failed, but who needs redemption. I need you, Lord, and I ask that you would come into my life, live your life in me, and I will live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord. And if you prayed that prayer with me just then, I want you to do something about it. I want you to tell people, look, I just prayed that prayer. I've given my heart to the Lord. I want to send you a packet. It's called A New Day. It's got a little CD in here. It's got a booklet. It'll tell you what it means to have a new life in Christ, what it means to be born again. And I'll give this to you free. So if you prayed with me, <clears throat> I just want you to go right now to your telephone. And it's a toll-free number. If you want further prayer, somebody's there. I want you to call in right now and say, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember. It's a toll-free number. 1-800-700-7000. And uh, somebody's here who will rejoice at the fact that you have just said yes to Jesus. Here's Terry. Well, still ahead, churches across the nation are slowly reopening. How is that affecting one of the largest in the nation? Dr. Tony Evans brings us his prescription for a pandemic. Stay with us. Welcome back, folks. You're watching The 700 Club. China's legislature has overwhelmingly backed a resolution to draft new security laws tightening control over Hong Kong. The new laws would give Beijing much broader powers over the territory and allow Chinese state security agents to operate there. Many say it spells the end of self-rule for Hong Kong. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announcing Wednesday that Washington, well, they are no longer going to treat Hong Kong as autonomous from China. Many seniors back here in the United States, they will not be having high school graduation this year, as you can imagine. So the youth ministry organization Dare to Share is teaming up with Faith Christian Academy and Interlink to bring graduates and their families a live stream event tonight called the National Senior Send-Off. It will be filled with inspirational events and encouraging remarks from Christian musicians, artists, and professional athletes. I believe students are gonna be inspired and equipped and unleashed, sent off for the glory of God to change the world. You can see it tonight from 8 to 9 Eastern on CBN platforms, including the CBN News Channel, which is available online, our streaming apps on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon, and the CBN News YouTube channel. Folks, as always, you can find out more about this story and get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. My friends, Pat and Terry, we'll be back with more of The 700 Club right after this. Churches across America are divided, and that was before stay-at-home orders forced people to self-isolate. So how can we be stronger together at a time when we're so far apart? Dr. Tony Evans has the answers. 
called one of the 12 most effective preachers in the world. Pastor Tony Evans is the founder and senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas. Known for his Say It Like It Is style, he's helped countless people grow in their faith and knowledge of God. God just doesn't get you out of a bicycle and move you to a bend. Dr. Evans says there's a critical need for unity amongst believers as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and afterward. In his latest of dozens of books, Stronger Together, Weaker Apart, he explains how the body of Christ can find unity no matter our differences. Dr. Tony Evans joins us now via Zoom, and we welcome you back to the program. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Good to be with you again. Well, your book, Stronger Together, Weaker Apart, comes at a time when people are being somewhat forced to be apart. How do we get stronger when we are asked not to get together, Tony? Well, the first thing we have to do is understand that um, this, this pandemic is really uh, designed by God to reset the church while it's mm -hmm. affecting the world. Uh, the church is the problem. Uh, many of the issues that we have in our culture today wouldn't be the way they are for as long as they've been if the church has not failed. God is a unified being, one God composed of three co-equal persons who is one in essence and distinct in personality. So he will not function in his full manifestation where there is illegitimate division. The, the, the racial crisis we're facing today, all of these issues really stem from a failed church. And God's not going to skip the church house to fix the White House. If we really want to see the hand of God move in rectifying not only this, this medical pandemic, but this social pandemic we're facing as well, then the church is going to have to be one in purpose without being same in persons. Unity is one that's a purpose in Scripture. And until we are unified... There is nothing you can do and nobody you can elect who can bring us together. And biblical unity is when you have a common goal that all the parts of the body are moving toward meeting bibliocentrically in a context of love. I know that recently you gave a message at your church entitled Prescription for a Pandemic. It sounds like the prescription for for the pandemic is the prescription that you're talking about that the church needs to pursue as well. Well, absolutely. Uh, the, this prescription, this uh, divine medicine involves, uh, first, first of all, uh, we need a national solemn assembly. This national solemn assembly or sacred gathering is where all biblically based churches across America call for fasting and prayer, crying out to God for him to intervene in our midst so that he can work to us in order that he might manifest himself through us. Secondly, according to Isaiah 58, we need to be in joint ministry to the poor and the oppressed. Okay, until we are in joint ministry, reconciliation doesn't come from seminars, it comes from service. And when you can serve together together, about meeting a common need, then you can have God intervene in the process. The third thing is, God says, if I can get you in a solemn assembly, unified, if I can get you in service, unified, then I will let you be a repairer of the breach. Then you will bring healing that the, that the social construct is not able to bring about. So until we could, God will only only answer prayers to the degree that he sees the unity. He won't even answer the prayer of a husband and wife who are disunified, 1 Peter 3, 7. He says, if the husband and wife are disunified, tell the husband, don't pray. God's not listening. Yeah. So a disun illegitimately disunified church is beckoning God away, no matter how many, how many times we use his name. Dr. Tony, talk a little bit about what we've just experienced in having to see on Facebook and on the news the horrific death of George Floyd. I think it's just been shocking and in some ways so clearly the work of the enemy to further divide people. How can we find unity in the midst of a situation like this? Well, first of all, God makes it clear that from his throne comes two principles all through the Bible. Justice and righteousness. Righteousness mm -hmm. is the code of right and wrong uh, that God expects all men to uh, uh, abide by. Justice is the equitable application of God's moral law in society. Those two must always stand side by side and never seesaw where one is up and the other is down. We, we must not only promote the right to life in the womb, but the right to life to the tomb. 
that is a comprehensive uh, plan for well-being. And we've not had that in this country consistently. We've had a seesaw situation. Until we come up with a whole life agenda and not a term life agenda, we will not see God intervene. What this situation has done is it, it, is, it is brought to, to the forefront the need for justice to be balanced with righteousness, and the church should be the leading spokesman for both equally. When we do that, we'll get God's attention. Your book is all about how we create and, and walk out this stronger together concept or principle. How do we best pray for unity in this hour? Well, first of all, we have to pray for unity based on uh, God's design for it, not man's declarations of it. When we pray and cry out to God that he might make us one in purpose, not sameness in persons, then we can use our uniquenesses. I mean, the racial differences are intended by God. The gender differences are intended by God. The social differences that are legitimate are intended by God. So we're not trying to trying to make all those the same. We're trying to we're trying to biblicize all of them and bring them under the rule of the kingdom of God. Until we become kingdom minded and not denominationally minded, we will not be Christ minded. And until we're Christ minded, we will not be socially. Well, you have a wonderful message in your book. I just want to tell folks the title of it and where they can get it. You can learn more from Dr. Tony Evans from his latest book. It's called Stronger Together, Weaker Apart. It's available in stores nationwide, and it's a, a wonderful message. You really set it up with your introduction for everything you have to share about how we can unify in prayer. Thank you so much. Great work. Thank you. Great to have you with us. Well, still ahead, get ready for another round of your questions and some honest answers. Lynn writes, for over a year, my older brother has been tormented by demons. The demons even manifest and say they want to destroy all of us. We've been praying, what else can we do? What will Pat say to that? Find out when we return. Well, this weekend marks Pentecost. To celebrate this event, we want to invite you to a special night of worship and encouragement. The Night of Promise is hosted by our own Gordon Robertson and Jonathan Burness of The Jewish Voice. Special guests include Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Jonathan Kahn, and many, many others familiar to you. It airs Friday night at 8 Eastern, and you can watch it on the CBN Family app, the CBN News Channel, on Facebook, and more. If you'd like information, go to nightofpromise.com or check your local listings. It'll be listed there. Yeah, a, a wonderful night event. for Israel. Yes. That's right. Okay. All right. You ready for some questions? Let's go for it. This is Lynn who says, for over a year, my older brother has been tormented by demons. He sees things we can't, points, and even talks to them. He howls, dances around, and screams for war. The demons even manifest and say they want to destroy all of us. We've been praying. What else can we do? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what you do in terms of, uh, of dealing with demons. Uh, the name of Jesus is more powerful than any demon, and you must command the demons to leave. And uh, don't play head games with demons. They'll try to talk to you and tell you stuff. But if indeed it's demonic, now it may be psychological. You've got to make sure you're dealing with a demonic thing and not some mental aberration. But assuming it's demons, command it in the name of Jesus. And it may take several of you. But I've, I've dealt with situations where people were demon-possessed, and you don't give up. You just c command, in the name of Jesus, you must lose that person. And I command you in Jesus' name, and don't let the person get off the hook. Stay with it, and the Lord will give you victory, all right? Okay, this is Amber, who says, My brother is engaged to the mistress that broke up his marriage, and they are living together. My Christian parents like to host gatherings at their house, but I do not feel comfortable if his fiance is there. Am I doing the right thing if I don't attend when she's there? Also, if my brother marries the mistress, does God view his marriage as still being adultery? Um, I, I think it sounds adulterous to me. He was had a mistress, and that broke up his marriage, and now he's he wants to get married to the mistress. Yes. Mm -hmm. well, and you don't want to participate. I, I see no problem with that whatsoever. 
So um, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you but let them know how come you're doing it. And uh, I, th I think that that would uh, you need to clarify exactly what your position is mm -hmm. and why that you oppose it. But uh, maybe maybe you could bring your brother to his senses. But it sounds like he's he's been captured. We leave you with these words from John. So if the sun sets you free, you are truly free. Well, for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Tomorrow we've got the dark secrets of Planned Parenthood. You don't want to miss it. See you then.